Hello again, it's Cliff here from Down Under. In this chapter of my engineering journey, I'll be going into some aspects of the installation of Slant Pro, my new CNC lathe, uh, some aspects of production of impact tolerant touch probe styluses, and uh, a little diversion into setting up your dial indicator if any of those subjects interest you. Cheers. And there's my new Slant Pro tucked away nicely in its little corner. I've got a temporary setup for the monitor and keyboard just to get me going. So this all fits in a small extension to the workshop, 4 meters by 4 meters. I've got the two 1100s with their mini compact enclosures. I've got other videos on that if you're interested. And then the uh, Slant Pro fitted in that corner. My workbench and uh, two cabinets for all the uh, bits and pieces. Um, so uh, really pleased with it. And there's still a nice big roomy floor area here to make it seem spacious. So I'm getting geared up for a bigger production run of parts for the Hallmark Impact Tolerant Touch Probe. And I've been doing modifications to help me with that. I've made a spindle extension. Um, it's a bit like the stock extension for the collet closer, but I wanted a slightly different setup. I've used my uh, existing uh, spindle stop to go in that bore, and um, it's bolted on the end of the uh, conventional place there. I've got a long. Uh, spindle stop adjustment there for certain types of work that I do where I need to reference the part uh, within the spindle um, and I uh, made up a manual 5C collet closer and also a drawbar for 5C chucking um, but the D14 system is a lot more rigid pulling up on this face and so I've made up a double sided adapter plate which I'm just going to cut in half now and then I can uh, uh, make up the uh, D14 studs and uh, mount those two back plates onto this 5 inch chuck and this 4 inch chuck and a um, ER32 uh, chuck that I'm getting in from eBay that holds an infinite range of sizes unlike the limitations of the 5C which only really grips on precision diameters at the small zone in the front and there's not much stock available in New Zealand that's to precision sizes and so it's not going to be used a great deal for the type of work that I'm doing anyway. So hopefully I'll have a chance to do some videos on some of this work in the future. I'm doing a job in the spark eroder at the moment and it frees up some time to do other things because it's running automatically. I'm just changing over electrodes and let's just have a wee look. It's actually for the impact tolerant touch probe stylus tips. There's uh, some there. I'm doing them in a row of 10. I've got other uh, videos on this if you're interested. Um, but this is just what I'm currently doing. Um, so I've got an electrode in there that I'm roughing all the holes out with. And then a finishing electrode that I'm going to set up next. And I'll do 10 at a time. And that's for the... Uh, stylus which is a hardened steel stem and a hardened uh, steel ball on the end and uh, there's some of the little balls there that are being produced at the moment quite an interesting little project and it runs automatically I've just got to walk over every few minutes and index over the next pitch for the next set of for the next ball the three most important things to know about spark eroding is flushing, flushing and flushing, they say. And it's imperative to have a good flow of dielectric fluid between the electrode and the work. Here I've got a tiny little micro hole um, that's allowing the dielectric fluid to get down there inside the hole where the eroding action is going on. And that hole is produced by inserting a little plug inside the electrode and then filing a tiny flat down the side of that plug. It's a bit small for me to video well with my uh, camera but um, this is about the best I can do but when you have this tiny little uh, flushing jet 
and you can't use too much pressure or that interferes with the eroding process but it, it can leave a very minute little spike of metal that, that is, uh, goes up inside the vent hole and then you need to turn the electrode around or use a finishing electrode so the flat's on the other side and then come back down and erode off the top of the little spikes in order to get um, a clean hole. And while the eroder is running automatically it's a good time to do a little bit of maintenance around the shop. One thing I've been meaning to do is check over and adjust my little finger style dial indicator. It's a good quality indicator. It's a, a gyro test or gyrod test, Swiss made, dual movement. It's a really good quality um, and I use it all the time, all day. So it gets used thousands of times a year and um, it's uh, still going strong. So one thing I've been meaning to do, not sure how well I can video this, if you have a look at the construction of the, the bearings in the end, the, uh, the stylus, the ball stylus, operates in what looks like little taper bearings. They're probably jeweled or hardened steel in there, um, and they must wear and get loose eventually. So uh, I'm just adjusting and checking that I've got the best possible adjustment there. There's a little adjustment screw in this side of on one side and I can just tighten it up and get the, the clearance out of that bearing but not so tight that I'm adding friction to the way it operates. See if I can show you how you can do that. So the first thing I did was back off the little screw so that it is definitely loose. So it's, now it's really rattling round in there. And then I get some kerosene on a little uh, hobby brush and brush out the bearings to make sure it's all clean coming in from both sides and really flushing it out. And then putting a little bit of Inox uh, lube in there, just a little bit of very fine oil before I pre uh, in preparation for making the adjustment. So the best adjustment that I want is to take the play out of those bearings um, but not so much that I'm adding any friction to those bearings. So with, with the, uh, the back off adjustment definitely backed off and it's rattling sideways, I can measure uh, what the uh, force is required to operate the dial indicator. If I put a thin piece of copper tube or something on there and measure it in the middle so it starts to move there. You can see it's taking about you know four or five millimeters before of flex before it starts to move the indicator. So that's a measure of the friction inherent within the dial indicator. So what I can do now is adjust up that little uh, tapered side of the bearing until I just begin to get a climb in the friction and at that point the adjustment is a little bit light so a, a little a, sorry at that point the adjustment is a little bit too tight and there would be too much friction so at that point I just need to back off a, a whisker um, and just find that threshold between it being too loose and too tight I don't want to add friction to that bearing but I don't want to have play in there either So I've just adjusted up that little adjusting screw until the sideways movement of the stylus um, is gone and the additional friction has not become a problem. It's probably got a little bit more friction on it now uh, than it had before but it's still very sensitive and um, you want to keep that adjusted up if you've got adjustment in your uh, indicator. Now this is a good quality indicator as I said it's got six ruby bearings and if those little bearings on the end are rubies and maybe hardened steel and ruby or something like that you don't want them rattling around in there because they'll wear out really unevenly if you do that and you'll lose the accuracy of your indicator. Another thing to watch out with these indicators these finger, finger indicators is that the little stylus tip is often um, able to be replaced and it's screwed on with a little thread uh, so you can put different types of tips on. Um, 
and it, if that comes loose you might not realize it and I've noticed this a couple of times on this indicator where the stylus tip is loose and um, you're getting false readings with your dial indicator that has to be tight obviously you've got to be very careful that it's not too tight otherwise you'd break that tiny little thread off but it does need to be firm here's a close-up of the stylus tips that come with the Skyrod TAS dial indicator and you can see the little threaded spigot and the little spanner that comes with it that allows you just to give it a little bit of tension on that thread just occurred to me a better idea would be to use some digital scales I did have some micro precision scales that would have been perfect for this but they stopped working anyway this will probably be good enough so if I bring the dial indicator down until the needle starts to operate I can measure the friction load which is or the spring load of the of the dial indicator plus the friction which is about 20 grams starts operating okay I'll back it off now and see whether I had it set right or not okay I've backed it off and the stylus is rattling so let's see how much different it is bring this tip down to contact yeah it's slightly less starting to move at about 16 grams so I did have a little bit of pretension on there so I'll just reset it now slightly lighter so I think that's about right if I come down now until it contacts it's contacting at about 16 17 so there's virtually no additional friction there now on that bearing adjustment and yet I can't feel any sideways play so that's probably pretty good here's a little tip I stumbled onto last year for cleaning small parts if you've got tiny parts like this and you don't want to lose them while you're cleaning them you can buy these little gauze containers in New Zealand um, from a two dollar shop probably in America from all sorts of places like is it Home Depot or something Walmart or something anyway um, you can then dip it in uh, solvent I'll put the compressor on now because I want to show you something pretty cool Now you watch this, maybe Albert Einstein saw this and it gave him some ideas about small particles. Theory of electrons. So you can clean your parts without losing them, dip them in solvent, blow them off, and tip them into your other container. Well that about wraps it up. Thanks guys for watching. If you're interested in the Hallmark Impact Tolerant Touch Pro, if you go to this YouTube channel's playlists, click on playlists, you'll see a whole series of videos on it. And if I remember, I'll put the most recent video in there, which is um, a Touch Pro versus a Heimer for accuracy and speed of setup. Thanks for watching guys, cheers.